You are on to a life transforming experience as Pastor Prince Abbott brings you God's word with deep insights and power. God bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. We would yet pray for another few minutes before we go, but let me show you something in um, Hebrews chapter 5. I'll read from verse 12. Let me try to open your um, your antennas to see why it's important to um, undertake the project that we have at hand. Um, one of the problems we observe in the church of today, in the body of Christ, is um, a level of gross irresponsibility amongst believers. A lot of Christians have uh, been in the church for many years, but um, you can't actually account for the progress or the... You can't actually see the trace of the number of time they have spent in the kingdom. You know, if you ask the average Christian when he gave his life to Jesus, he will tell you many years ago. And um, you look out for the marks and the fruits and the and the benefits or the result, rather, of being in Christ. And you hardly can find it. So, um, it's a concern for me and it's a concern actually to God himself. Because the end result of what we are doing is to bring every believer to the fullness of Christ's maturity, the fullness of Christ's stature. The mission statement of this church, the mission statement is to deliver and disciple every believer into Christ's total maturity. And then in bracket we put both mental, spiritual, we put socially and otherwise. And by so doing, raise an army of deliverers that will change the world in all spheres and in all ramifications. So if you look at the first part of that mission statement, you see that the fundamental purpose for this ministry, which is also captured in the scriptures, because our mission is not just one guesswork. It is something captured from the scripture. It is something that is captured in the purpose of God for the church. So, Salvation or Christianity actually has a three main, goes through a circle that has three major compartments. The first in that circle is deliverance. When a, a person is born again, he has been delivered from the kingdom of the darkness and he has been brought into the kingdom of light. So, born, being born again means to be delivered from Satan delivered from the word, delivered from sin, and then translated into the kingdom of God's marvelous light. And that happens when you confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior and accept him in your heart. So deliverance happens at that point. That's why if you know what it means to be a Christian and a born again, the devil has no right over you anymore. Hear this. A man who has been removed or plucked out from the world, plucked out from darkness, plucked out from the hands of the devil, is no longer the devil's property. It's now the property of God. What that means is that the devil has no right over that person anymore. There is a lot of benefits that is tied to being a Christian. Any man who is not saved, any man who is not saved is not saved. You will be a candidate for all kinds of oppression, all kinds of humiliation and attacks from the kingdom of darkness. Once you are born again, you are now brought into a kingdom that is superior than the kingdom of darkness. And there are benefits that are tied to your being part of this kingdom. 
Salvation qualifies you to receive everything that Jesus made available on the cross. If you are born again, you shouldn't suffer again. If you are born again, you shouldn't be sick. If you are born again, you shouldn't be poor. Because through his death, he exchanged your poverty for his riches. Through his death, he exchanged his sickness, your sicknesses for healing. That's what the Bible said that by his stripes, you were healed. There are benefits that just deliverance alone, just that faith alone, just accepting Jesus alone, if you know what you have. But, I began to ask the Lord, Father, a lot of people who are delivered are not collecting these things that you have made available for them. Why is this so? And God told me, have you ever seen a baby who was born into a rich family? Born into a very wealthy home. Physically. And then maybe the nurse, at the point he was born, exchanged the baby, took the baby, and gave it to another person. And maybe this person is a very poor person. And then this baby, who was born by a rich man, began to be raised by a poor man. You see, though the father who gave birth to this baby is rich, the baby is going to grow up poor. Why? Because the baby has lost identity of who he is. So there are many Christians who are born again, but they don't know the benefits of the kingdom they belong. They don't even know who their father is. So many Christians are living very defeated lives. And it is not meant to be so. Which is why when you come to church, part of what we are doing is to teach you your inheritance in God. Part of what we are doing is to communicate to you the realities of your new birth. Part of what we are doing is to expose you to the new life you have in God. That this life is superior. This life is incorruptible. If any man be in Christ, the Bible says he is a new creation. And I will say all things have passed away. The old things includes both your past life, your sinful life. It, it includes all the causes. It includes all your con, all your all your 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 poverty. It includes everything. All your suffering. He said, "All things have passed away." And I say, "All things have become new." So, in a place like this, one of our primary goals and responsibility is to expose you to this truth. So that you begin to lay hold on them. You have no reason to be defeated again in this world. The devil had been defeated on the cross. If you don't believe it, well I'm sorry. Death was defeated on the cross. I have no reason to die. I have no reason to bury a new body. Because he died the death I should have died. Sickness has been defeated on the cross. I have no reason to suffer sickness again. Poverty has been defeated on the cross. I have no reason to be poor again. This thing is first a revelation. It's first an understanding. It's first a knowing. You have to know it first before you start functioning in the reality of it. You will not walk in this thing. You will not see the experience. You won't see the experience of this reality in your life until the revelation enters your spirit. There's a lot of benefits in deliverance. But that's just part one of the journey. There's part two of the journey. God, aside all the benefits he has for you when you give your life to God, he has higher benefits that he wants you to also access. There are things you will not be able to access as a Christian if you stop at the level one, which is the deliverance phase. You're just born again. Just reaping the benefit of being a saved believer. Just collecting all the benefits of being a Christian. That's just elementary. There are higher things that God has for you. I can show you that God's purpose and plan for you is not to end at the deliverance phase. God's purpose and plan for you is to move you to the second phase. Where you are not just collecting the fruits of salvation, but you are now a tree of salvation. Hmm? You are now a tree of salvation. You know you can go to the market and go and buy orange. When you bring orange to your house, you peel it and take oranges, and the oranges are finished. 
The next day you go to the market, buy oranges, you peel oranges, take oranges, the oranges are finished. Hello, are you with me? Yeah. But now you see, what you're getting is the fruits. You're just buying fruits. That's what deliverance face is like. It's children face. That's a face where you're claiming your healings, you get your healing. That's a face where you're buying the devil over your fine. Yeah, things happen at that level. Miracles and all that, it happens. Favor, grace, you enjoy all that. But now, like I said, it's like going to the market to buy fruits. The second phase, now which I want to show you, and that's where I'm going to end now, is where you are no longer buying oranges from the market. You now get orange tree planted in your compound. So that anytime you need orange, you just go to the tree in your house and blow. You have the system that generates the fruit in your house. Please, somebody open up your head and hear what I'm saying. I need you to, there's something I really want to happen to you. The, the miracle that has happened to me. I really want it to happen to you. So, the second phase is very critical. If you want to now move from fruit level to tree level. To the tree, the tree, the tree. This afternoon I went somewhere, setting farm somewhere. So they took us around, showed us some things, and then I bought some things from there. Bought um, coconuts. I bought some drinks, and incidentally, most of those drinks I bought are produced right on the farm. Now I bought like six of those drinks or so. Took them home. I've taken about one or two. When the drinks finishes. I will still need to go back to the farm to go and buy more drinks. It finishes again, I will go back and buy more drinks. So what I'm buying from the farm is the product. The farm is the producer. That's where the factory, the farm is a factory. But what I'm getting out of the farm is the product. I think you don't want your Christian life to end at product phase. You see how some of you choose to settle small. You go and buy bread from bakery. You think you are, you go, go to Roban's bakery, you buy one loaf of bread and then you are fine. You can take your tea and all that. You finish this, you go back again, go and buy bread. Finish, go back again. Why not begin to think of becoming the bakery? It's of being a bread Christian. That's what we want to take you to. So that instead of collecting healing, you are now dispensing healing. You now move from being a Christian who is just collecting prosperity. You now, instead of being a Christian who is just blessed, you become a blessing. Instead of being a container, you become a channel. That's the second phase we want you to enter. But you don't just enter there. You don't just get there overnight. There is a process that takes you there. Instead of just, you know, you become the bakery where the bread is manufactured. So let me now show you that one scripture I want to show you and close. If everyone here just goes through the process, you will see that we'll become a church of, of leaders, of men and women who are shaking their world. The church is full of a lot of people who are coming just to receive fruits. But they are not willing to pay the price to become the tree that produces the fruit for their world. So there's a big problem. And when God gave me the vision and the mission of this ministry, I know clearly that what he was calling me to do is different from what churches everywhere is doing. It's not just to pastor a church, get head deck all the time, preach and shout and vibrate and then shake, shake, shake and just lay hands on you and then you're all right. No, it's not, that's just part one. The part two is the main thing he called me to do. Hebrews chapter 5, see verse 12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, he didn't say you ought to be teacher. So he's not talking to one person. He's talking to the entire congregation. This is God's plan to turn every believer into a teacher. 
but they won't be taught. You can't be a teacher. I say by this time, you should be a teacher. That means before that time, the process of time guarantees that you should be a student. So you are now helping other people to grow, to learn through the same process that you came through. And I can tell you what is cast in the body of Christ today are teachers. We don't have them. So most of the burden of ministry is left on just the, the pastor, the senior pastor. He has to do everything, pray for everybody. He has to lay hands on everybody. He has to cancel everybody. Everybody has to come to him to get explanation for this or that or that. There's something wrong with that too. But you need to understand that that's not God's model for doing ministry. Even God specified clearly the purpose of the five-fold ministry. The five-fold ministry is made up of five offices. Number one is the office of the apostle. Number two is the office of the prophet. Number two is the office of the evangelist. Number three is the office of the, um, what do you call it? Of the, the pastor and then the teacher. Not the teacher and the pastor, if I'm correct. Is in that order. The teacher and the pastor. Now these five offices, the scripture clearly states their purpose. It says they are given for the equipping of the saints. That's for the training of the believers. It now says for the work of the ministry. So even as your pastor, my primary assignment is not just to do miracles. It's part of my assignment. But that's not the major assignment. My major assignment is training the believers. For the work of ministry. What is now the work of ministry? The work of ministry is to deploy the believers that have been trained to go and have reap the harvest. To go and change their world. To change their environment. To change their society. To change people's lives. To preach the gospel. To win souls. That's the work of ministry. But you will not be effective in that job until you have been passed through the process of discipleship, which is what your pastor is meant to do. Your pastor is meant to train you and teach you and develop you and equip you with one thing in mind, to deploy you to go and do ministry. And what is ministry? Ministry is now helping to parent other people. Ministry is actually parenthood. It's actually parenting people, mentoring people, growing people, helping people find direction in life, helping people find meaning in life, giving people direction and a sense of purpose. You know those days, okay, yeah, I'm the first son in my family, for instance, but when I was in kindergarten and all those nursery school, and all, I used to have aunties and uncles who lived with us, older than us. So when I come back from school, I usually would take my assignments to them. I say, see, they gave us assignment today. Quantitative reasoning or verbal aptitude or whatever they call it. And they will open, they will look at it and they will begin to teach me. They will begin to teach me. They will begin to teach me. And when I go to school the next year, I scored 10 over 10. Why is the man able to teach me? Because he has gone through that class. So he knows that course. He has gone through it. He is now in SS3. Near me reception on primary one. He is now in SS3 class. He knows all that. That's the same way in the church. We need to have people like that out of you. Who new babies in the faith can run to and say, Please, what does new birth mean? Please, what does it mean to be born again? Please, what does it mean to be... What is grace? I keep hearing pastor talk about grace. Grace. What's the meaning of grace? I hear pastor talk about uh, forgiveness of sin. What is even sin? What is forgiveness of sin? I hear him talk about the, the finished work. What is finished work? There are many people in our churches who are confused about these terms. They, they may be saying, wow, right on, sir. But there, some of them may not be able to come and ask. But it, it confuses them. How I know most times is when I'm engaging some people one on one and we're talking and I'm so shocked how a full fledged young man or young woman is very ignorant about the elementary things in the scriptures and in the kingdom. If we don't begin to reproduce leaders and disciples out of everyone in our churches, then it means that this harvest will not be reaped. It will be difficult to reap the harvest. 
The Bible says that indeed the harvest is plenteous. He now said the laborers are few. He said, now pray the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into the harvest. If you have a house where all the children in that house, all the people who live in the house are children, maybe they are two years, one year, two years, one year, two years, one year, and you have, let's say, 50 of them. Hmm? And you wake up in the morning, you have bed to dress, you have uh, water to go and fetch from the well, you have clothes to wash, you have other clothes to iron, you have food to uh, cook, you have house to sweep, and you have, and all the people who you have in the house living with you are one year, two year. Do you have a helper? Nobody can help you. In fact, you're going to have more problems. With, in addition to these ones you already have, with this problem of fetching water, those ones as you're fetching and thinking of finishing to come and sweep, they have already littered the whole room, scattered your bed, painted your wall with their crayon and colors. And you'll be wondering what kind of problem, because what you have is children. So a church that has 1,000 children members is not yet successful. You don't rate a church or you don't determine the success of a church by the seating capacity. You, you determine the, the capacity or the, or the, the vibrancy of a church by sending capacity. Not the sitting capacity. If you're using how many people who fill up the church to say that, oh, this church is successful. That's not the yastic. The real yastic is to check how many laborers are coming out from these people. How many men, how many mature men and women, how many leaders, how many disciple makers, how many elders. And elders are not old people. Elders are how many sons, how many mature people. And it's not an age thing. For instance, see this my son. Bring this my child here for me. Come. This, this boy is... See, let me show you what discipleship is like. Come. You see how he's dressed? Are you see how he's dressed? Very responsible. Many of his mates don't dress like this. He's just in Genesis 3 class. Hmm? Just in Genesis 3 class. So he's in the technical department. When service finishes now, he's the one that will go and turn speaker, get the microphone, put them in their casing, get the cloth, cover them. He's the one that runs to go and buy fuel. He goes to school. Once it's time for church, he's back home. Bad thing to service is over. He's, he's the one running to go and buy battery. And the young boy, three. What is happening to this guy now is beyond his age. Because age is not how you check a person's maturity. How you see a person mature is that what he's sitting on. The kind of things he hears here. Like I'm having trainings, he'll come and sit down and he listens to me. I'm having service, he'll come and sit down. He joins the department, he's running errands, he's solving problems, he's in the service. I, I saw when he ran out to go and check, maybe it's where he went to check. So he's in the service, you are here, but he has run out to go and check whether the fuel has gone down. He sees where he's going there. He's thinking, how do I replace? That's why I can wear shoe, wear trouser, and put tie. Imagine before, he's, by the time he gets to SS3, by the time he's in year one, his campus will be on fire. Are you seeing what training can do? So, go and sit down. It doesn't matter how you come to God or how you come to the kingdom. When you submit to process, to training, that's what God is not looking for people who are old. This issue about uh, leadership is not about age. It's not about who is old or who is not old. It's about the people who are willing to give themselves wholeheartedly. They are willing to go through all the training. They are willing to go through all the, the, the maturing. They are willing to go through all the teaching until they get to that point where two them can become leaders for other people. Now I show you some things. Just to buttress on the example I even gave you. Let me show you this scripture. Hebrews chapter 5, look at verse 12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and no solid food. So there are two kinds of food in the kingdom. There's milk and there's solid food. 
Milk is a kind of teachings or preachings you on Sunday when you come to church. There are a lot of milk, milk, milk Christians. So it's important. Sometimes we do milk gospel. When we are preaching and prophesying, receive your healing and your shout amen. This week, you're getting your breakthrough. This week, I announce to you, your miracle is coming. They are good gospel, but it's milk gospel. Because it's the gospel of delivery. Of delivery. It's only giving things. You're only receiving things. It's just giving you things. It's like my baby, for instance. Every time she comes around, daddy must give me something. You're always giving things. Always receiving things. So she, she can't wash plates. She can't clean the house. She can't wash the car. She can't do anything. All she can do is collect. Collect food, milk. That's milk gospel level. And there are many Christians like that in the church. All they are collecting is healing. All they are collecting is breakthrough. All they are collecting is grace. All they are collecting is favor. Laying of hands and all that. You can never put anything in their hand and it will survive. Because they are babies. So God is saying to a certain class of people now. That look, I have been observing you for some times. By this time, in the faith, you are supposed to be a teacher. You're supposed to be the one who is like a parent to other people. You're supposed to be the one who is like a tutor and a guardian to other people. But you are not becoming that because you're still taking milk. Milk cannot develop you. Milk cannot give you capacity. So the reason you are not growing and maturing is what you're feeding on. Milk. You're, you're not willing to give yourself to the training and the process that will now turn you into a full-fledged man. That will turn you into a full-fledged woman. A man that God can say, yes, I have a son in that person. A woman God can say, yes, I have a son in that person. He can put anything in your hand and that thing will grow. He can entrust certain revelations and mysteries of the kingdom in your hand and you can faithfully communicate it to other people without confusing them. He can put people in your hand. You can take responsibility for their growth. You cannot put <laughs> children in the hands of a child to take care of. It's not possible. I can't believe my house and I tell my daughter, Sarah, please take care of the children at home. Who is going to take care of whom? She doesn't have that capacity. It's an adult who you tell to do that. That's what the Bible said. Though a child, he may be the heir and may be the inheritor of the father's estate. But as long as he's a child, he differed nothing from a slave. He's kept under tutelage. He's kept under tutors. And the tutor might not even be a son to the father. The tutor might not even be a son or a daughter to the mother. The tutor might be a hired nanny. A hired nanny may be the tutor. And then this is a child of a whole dangote. But it's one year, two years. This is a child of a whole president of a country. But it's one year, two years. And maybe he wants to go and um, on the television in the house. Or he takes daddy's key. Because he feels daddy has all the cars. So let me go and on one. Two years old baby. As he's going, you'll be so shocked. How one lady who is the daughter of a farmer. Or who is the daughter of a palm wine tapper. Will get a whip and whip the ass of that boy. Go and drop that key. Where are you taking it to? There's my daddy's car. I want to go and start it. Give me that key now. Junior, give me that key now. And who is doing it to Junior? A house girl. Why? Because a house girl has capacity to take care of Junior. The Junior is the son, the inheritor of that same car. Is the inheritor of that same house the father has. But the baby cannot inherit anything. Until he has grown into full age. That is how you as a Christian. There are inheritances that we have. Things that God has slated that we must be partakers of. We must inherit in this world. But until you grow in the spirit. Until you grow. Until you attain spiritual maturity. You can't get there. You can't get there. Okay, I'm able to teach you with such level of simplicity, 
with such level of, you know, I, I, I can teach anybody. Are you able to understand, even if you are a, you're coming to the faith for the first time, why I have grown? So that's why I can use any kind of illustration. That's why I can use any kind of, you know, diagram. I can play with anything just to make sure I pass the same message to you. If I did not attain spiritual maturity, I can't train you. I can't teach you. Do you see how I'm able to affect your lives in positive ways? And some of you are grateful that you hear the things you're hearing under me. Now, can you now begin to imagine if everyone here now has what I have? If everyone here carries the same capacity, carries the same grace, the same knowledge, the same revelation, the same, you know, ability like I carry. Do you know the kind of exploit we would do in these states and beyond? The way a father will not want his children to remain children forever or for a long time. Baby is peeing on the bed. When he finishes peeing, they carry the form outside for him. There is a one year child. No, when that child begins to cross certain stage, you are now seven years, you are now ten years, and you still pain. We should flog you. Something is wrong with you. That's no longer babyhood. That's irresponsibility. There's a stage people do things in the kingdom. You know this is babyhood. There's a stage they start doing it. You know it's not babyhood again. It's irresponsibility. You don't say it's a baby. He's supposed to have passed that baby level. It's that the person has decided to stay irresponsible and has refused to grow. And if you know the cost, if you know the cost of that, and the harm and the damages it causes ministry, the harm and the damages it causes ministry, if you know what it does to ministry. Now look at what it says. It says, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. Verse 13 says, for everyone who partakes only of milk, hear this, everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled, is unskilled in the word of righteousness for he is a baby. Everyone who is only coming to church to get prophecy. Everyone who's only coming to church to get laying of hands. Everyone who's only coming to church to come and hear a pastor say something about him, prophesy and all that. If that's all you want, God's word is saying to you, you are going to be unskilled. Have you ever seen a football team playing well that didn't go through training? You must go through training, rigorous training, you know, and then you're able to play well on the pitch. Then the multitude will come to watch you play. So those who just rely on milk are unskilled. People who just rely on Sunday service alone, Sunday morning, they just come, hear good message, and they are happy, they give their tithe, their offering, and then they go home. They will be unskilled in the word of God. Because Sunday service is not what raises leaders. Sunday service is usually for the masses. It's, that's what we call a celebration of mass. Hmm? It's for the masses. So you bring everybody together. We preach a message that can go for everybody. Heal the sick, raise the dead, do miracles. And they are still part of the kingdom. At my age, I still take milk. If I want to take pap now, or I want to take, uh, what do you call it? I want to take uh, uh, custard milk. Custard um, um, pap, right? I still add my pig milk. I want to take tea. I still add my milk. It doesn't mean I don't take milk at all. So for instance, if I'm sick now, I have a spiritual father. I go to him. Say, Daddy, lay hands. We all need milk at some point in our work with God. But the issue is that you don't rely on it. As a son now in the kingdom, I don't rely on milk. I don't take milk for growth. Mm -mm. Milk can't grow me. I take solid food to grow. And then verse 14, which is the final. Say, but solid food belongs to those who are full of age. That is those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. I don't know who understood exactly what I just said now. Solid food belongs to which people? Let me read it for you from, there's another translation, it's called New Living Translation. 
Let's see how New Living Translation captured it in verse 14. It says, solid food is for those who are mature, who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. Let's see it from Message Translation and see how, how message the Message Bible. Okay, first of all, let's look at it from Amplified Version. You see, solid food. It say are uh, from people, from mature people, who by training, they don't want to say who by use, have their senses. For instance, the boy I gave you an illustration with, something is happening to that boy's destiny without his even knowing. For somebody to sit down, and then his senses is in the service, he's writing, but he knows that there's a generator he's accountable to. That he needs to check fuel. Somebody's senses is being exercised. So, somebody who ordinarily should have forgotten is now conscious of remembrance because he is put into use. He's put into use. So, because he's useful in the kingdom, because he's being used in the kingdom, his senses are being exercised. His maturity is being expanded. His scope of thinking is being expanded. His capacity to innovate is expanding. His capacity to think is expanding. This is what spiritual maturity, training in the kingdom does to you. For instance, I give you connect groups now. I say, okay, be part of connect groups where you are you may not be able to teach now, but okay, join a connect group around you and start being part of what they are doing. It's part of maturing you. I'm going to put it together. The one, for instance, who has the privilege to be the teacher of that connect group, if he's wise, that's the opportunity he has to become like me. He's going to take it so serious because now you have a lot of outlines and manuals that you're going to be communicating people, you're going to be teaching other people scriptures that are written in those manuals. It will make you to sit down and study your Bible because you know in that your connect group where there are ten people, twelve people, or where there are five people, as the case may be, people are coming to listen to you. So because you are accountable to people, you're going to be working extra time to know what this scripture is talking about. You're going to start listening to my tapes more. You're going to start doing more research on the scriptures. Why? Because now you have responsibility on you. So you see what matures a baby is responsibility. You want to turn a baby into adulthood, put responsibility on that baby's life. Put responsibility on that baby's shoulder. He will mature. You see children who are spoiled. Girls who just grow up, they don't wash plates, they don't cook because they have one house girl who does all that. The house girl may be small. I have one on my street. Every time they are bullying the girl, they are beating her, they are, I even sent clothes to her one day. And I said to the woman, I said, don't worry, you don't know what you're doing to this girl. Keep bullying her, keep doing all this. You're training her. Your own child, you may be treating like a sacred cow. She doesn't wash plates. She doesn't carry, doesn't do any chores. She doesn't sweep anything. Sometimes my daughter, when they are sweeping in the house, she will come and be struggling broom with them or struggling mop with them or struggling some things with them. And when she starts doing it, I say, give it to her. I say, leave her. Somebody wants to sweep at her age. She wants to do, give it to her. She's telling you she's learning something from you. She sees people sweeping. She's learning. You're setting good examples. Even if she's using the mop to dirty what you have mopped, Allah, when she finishes dirty, you go and remop it again. But something is happening to her as she does that. A foolish father will say, no, Sarah, don't touch it. Queens, don't touch this. Queens, don't touch mop. Queens, don't. You will raise a stupid queen. A foolish queen who will get married tomorrow and be a disaster to her home. Hmm? Yes, sir. So, it, do you want us to have a church of mature men and women? A church of me, sons, real sons. When you look at them, they are elders. 
They can handle things in people's lives. They can handle things in cities. They can handle things in nations. They can handle things in their environment. They can alter things in people's destiny. Do you want us to have such a church? This connect group is the fastest way to raise people like that. Listen, it doesn't matter how many years you've been in Christ. You can be one day old and start growing very fast. I start growing very fast. I start growing very fast. You don't need to be in ministry or you don't need to be in uh, in the church forever for many, many decades before you catch it. From where you are now, your journey can begin. Okay, I said we're going to read Amplify. Let me do justice to that and then we'll just pray because my time is up. Verse 14. Solid food is for those who are mature, who through training... Okay, no, that's not it. I didn't tell. That's NLT. Okay, now Amplify this here. But solid food is for the spiritually mature whose senses are trained by practice to distinguish between what is morally good and what is evil. Let me let me do the last translation which is the message Bible. I don't know if you're learning something. Stop running away from training. You know? Stop running away from training. You know? Stop running away from discipleship, from meetings, from responsibilities. Stop running away. You won't grow like that. Anybody who you see who is constantly running, who is constantly running away, running away from the tank, come and do this, he runs away. Come and do this, he runs away. A certain lady was talking to me the other day. I was somewhere to preach, so I heard her sing and play on the keyboard. And she came to greet me after the meeting. And I complimented her. I told her, see me one of these days. And then she came to see me. When she came, I told her, I said, how did you, you know, you, you play, do there are some things you need to steal. I heard you, but you sing. But what is particular for me is the anointing with which you minister. And then she said, okay, this is how the journey started for me. He said there was scarcity of hands in church. A father is a pastor. So there's, there was scarcity of hands. Nobody was playing on the keyboard. Nobody could play the drum. Nobody. There was just nobody. So they tried to get people who would be doing that. They couldn't find church, small church. So she decided to volunteer herself. And she didn't go to any school, but because of that vacuum, she sat down and began to just try to listen to songs and just try to get one or two keys and play along. He said that is how she discovered she had music inside that she didn't know. And then that's the journey for her. Today they are inviting her to come and sing here. She will go sing and play. They will pay her money and all that. Why? Responsibility. You know what responsibility means? Responsibility means respond to your ability. Every responsibility you see in the kingdom is calling your ability to work. It's calling your ability to the table. It's it's inviting you. It's calling you to respond to an ability within you. There's something inside you can, you have. Something you have. It might be a lacuna in the church. Maybe the ushering unit is having lapses. There are no people. Maybe the sound people need more people. Maybe the key, the, the, the instrument need more people. Maybe we need more people in the protocol team. Maybe we need more people in different departments. Don't look down on anything in the kingdom. Every place you see a lapse in the kingdom is inviting you to growth. Is inviting you to growth. When you're given a responsibility, come join this department. Come join this unit. Come take this. I know you can lead a cell. Or when they tell you, okay, start winning souls. Next Sunday when you're coming, bring three persons with you. you? Don't say no. They are stressing you. The best usually comes out of of stress. The best always comes out of the stress. I can tell you this. You can't get the best of lifting until it goes through all that. You can't get the best of orange until you squeeze it. You can't get the best of anything until you pass it through some kind of heat. So where a lot of Christians make mistakes is that they think that things should just be easy. No. When you enter discipleship, is training. There are certain assignments you'll be given. Certain things you'll be told to do. And in telling you to do this, they are not killing you. They are only maturing you. It's only a process of maturity. So connect group as I close is one of just one. Just one out of many other things. One. Out of many other things we do To train people to mature people. I tell you a story and we'll close. Because 
you know, in the kingdom, we also have general overseers who are sitting under general overseers, so-called. We have um, people who are popes, popes, popes. They will never do anything. Tell them, come and join choir. They'll tell you, I'm still praying. Prayer warrior, Ketrin Kuman. Go and join us in the department. I'm still fasting. The Holy Ghost have not spoken to me. Ketrin Kuman. I was listening to Dr. W.F. Kumi you did that day. And then he said something. Just two days ago, I was watching him on Facebook. On my phone. He said, that many years ago, he was, he attended a conference somewhere. And he went with some of his leaders. You know, Dr. W.F. Kumi is a deeper life man. How many of you know Pastor E. Adeboye of Redeem Christian Church? Do you know he's not the original founder of Redeem? But do you know he's one of the greatest ministers of the gospel in the world today? The greatest. Are you aware of that? One of the most influential men on earth today. Yet, do you know how he started? He was a university lecturer in University of Lagos. Do you know how he started the journey that has taken him where he is? He started as an interpreter. And the man he was interpreting for, who is the original founder, of redeemed Christian Church of God is a stark illiterate. The man couldn't speak English. So the man will be preaching in Yoruba and Pastor Adebo will be interpreting in English. He had a PhD already as a university lecturer. But he was that humble to interpret for a stark illiterate. Do you see why God has picked such a man and made him who he is? He was not interpreting because he was eyeing the office of the geo. Mm -mm. He was just faithfully discharging his duties and illiterate. So W.F. Kumi was telling the story, Pastor W.F. Kumi was telling the story of how he traveled with some of his leaders one time for a training. And when he got for that training, three days or so, one week or so, they got through. And then the organizer said, okay, everybody who comes who want to be who wants to go through counseling should just wait behind. There are counselors that will do counseling for them. So at the end of the training, people started going and a few people waited for counseling. And him, he also waited to be, to go through counseling. He said at that time, he was already pastoring 7,000 people as a pastor. 7,000 people as a pastor. So he sat down and was waiting. Some of his leaders told him, sir, are you not going? He said, no, I'm waiting for the counseling. He said, ah, you are the one who should be counseling people. You're waiting for counseling. He said, do you know what you're talking about? He said, you don't know how far I want to go. That's why you're saying what you're saying. Then guess what? When it was his turn to be counseled, they sent him to some guy sitting somewhere, a younger guy. He went, sat down. The person said, okay, you're welcome. What's your name? He said, WF Kumi. He said, okay. What do you do? He said, I'm a pastor. What's the name of the church? He mentioned. It's okay. How long have you been pastoring? He mentioned. It's okay. What's the size of your church? He said, we are 7,000 people. The guy looked at him. You are 7,000. And you're sitting down here to be cancelled. He said, do you know how many minutes this council is supposed to last? He said, yes. How many minutes? He said, 30 minutes. He said, hold on. He went to his ogre and said, sir, please, I, I still have some people to cancel. But there's an interesting man interesting young man I'm sitting with now and I'm going to spend two hours with him. Please, can you push some of my people to another team? I need to tell that guy some things. He went back and sat down with him. He said, I'm going to spend two hours with you because who you are talking with now, you may not know. I am the MD and CEO of Coca-Cola bottling, is it bottling? Coca-Cola company. The company that produces coke in the world. I am the owner. And what is even shocking is that people who are even MDs of such companies can do counseling in church. <laughs> it's even shocking. They can even be humble enough to sit down and help people in church counseling. What if we ask some of you now, okay, join counseling department in church, help people, interview people, lead people to Christ, help people, follow people. You'll be too busy to do it. So, the man said, I have, 
conglomerate of this company everywhere in the world. And I'm aware you know. He said, yes. He said, what I'm going to share with you in two hours now, if I'm able to finish, I will give you another appointment tomorrow and I'll spend the whole day with you. He said, what I want to share with you now is the secret of Coca-Cola. He said, because you cannot be pastoring 7,000 people and be humble and not expect me to teach you what I know. I'll open up everything. You are pastoring 7,000. You should have been proud by now. You should have arrived by now. Yet you sit down here for me to teach you, to cancel you. I'll show you everything about Coca-Cola. The man brought out his pen and began to write. He taught him everything. They didn't finish the following day. They continued. They spent the whole day. Pastor W.F. Kumu, you said, if you want to know why deeper life is great, it was that counseling session. He said, every model and structure he showed me on how Coca-Cola was able to spread around the world, he told me to take the same model, apply it to ministry, and we'll have the same result. He said, what he told me was a business secret. I only introduced in ministry and I got the same result you are getting. If it was a proud person, solid food are for men who by use have their senses exercised. You know why you're not serving in God's kingdom? It's because you're proud. Of. The proud can't serve. Then you know why you're not growing in the things of God? It's because you're not serving. The pathway to greatness, that's why Jesus said, he that will be the greatest amongst you will be the least of all. The pathway to greatness is the pathway of service. Is the way of service. Solid food are for men, mature men, who by use have their senses exercised. Some of you will need to open up your house to become connect centers. Some of you will need to volunteer yourself to become connect group facilitators. Some of you will need to avail yourself to be in departments, to be HODs, to belong to a department and then serve, give yourself to service, give yourself so that we can raise mature men and women from here that God can trust and entrust them with certain things and he can go to sleep and say, this one, I know he's going to deliver. Stand on your feet, let's pray and go. We no longer need children in the body of Christ. There's nothing wrong with having them, but now we need to raise mature believers. Because there's a lot of harvest. There's a lot, a lot, a lot. Numerous number of souls out there waiting for the manifestation of sons, not children. Amen. So you're going to pray for yourself right now and ask the Lord to help you to truly become a son in the house. To give yourself to process of trainings, to give yourself to discipleship, to give yourself to every equipping that is required to produce a leader and produce a disciple maker and produce a teacher out of you. That's the era God wants to move us now into. It would take us nothing to populate this place with thousands and thousands of souls. What it will take are sons, men who are sold out to the work of God. People who don't want to just be coming to church as children, as they are in their offices, as they are in the campus, as they are in their house, what they are thinking about is souls, souls. How do I bring more people? Is souls. They are thinking of how do I start more centers, connect groups, more centers. Look at, for instance, all the churches like Redeem, you see, where they have network of churches around the world, everywhere, some street alone, you see more than 10 Redeem. And most of those churches are pastored by professors. Some of them are pastored by senior leaders of Nigeria. Some of them are pastored by architects, by bankers, lawyers, successful people. How come these men will give themselves for service in the kingdom like that? I've seen senior leaders of Nigeria who are pastoring in that ministry and they're exploding, they are growing, all kinds of things happening with them. Your own generation don't seem to want to serve God. Once you know one small thing like that, pride enters. You feel nobody can talk to me again. Do you know that through you, God can extend this ministry to the nations of the world? Through you, starting from where you are now, 
God can trust you and put this mandate as a burden in your heart. And then as a son, you will carry this burden of your father. Planting it everywhere and doing it faithfully with joy in your heart. And God will be promoting you, blessing you, turning you into a millionaire, into billionaires, and yet there's still humility in your heart. You are still serving. You are still humble. You still honor your father. You are not breaking ranks. If you see the kind of joy you're going to bring to God for being such a person. The church of this end time seems to be very irresponsible. People just want to do things on their own. They want to be on their own. They don't want to be part of what God is building. Ask God to help us tonight. Open your mind and pray. Church, I can't hear you pray. Ask God to open our spirits to receive these truths. Ask God to change us from babyhood Christianity. It's time to mature. It doesn't matter when you give your life to Jesus. Your journey can begin now. If you see what will happen, the miracle of a transformed life. You'll be so shocked that you can parent other people. You can become an elder brother, an elder sister to other people. Through you, people will begin to come to the knowledge of Jesus. Through you, people will become new creation in Christ. Through you. Through you. Who will multiply sons for God through you? Are you ready to give yourself to God's word? Are you ready to give yourself to the scriptures, to the Bible? Give yourself to my tapes. Give yourself to training. Give yourself to mentorship under me. The guy who was preaching said, Some of you, when you begin to do this thing, you will see addictions will die. Some of you, the spirit of loss will die. Some of you, pride, arrogance, certain things will begin to leave you. Because as you are solving these problems in the life of other people, God will be taking care of it in your own life. Some of you, God will begin to work out His patience in your life. Some of you, God will begin to work out the fruit of the Spirit in your life. Some of you begin to see selfishness will begin to die. Some of you begin to see all the vices will begin to disappear. Your mind needs to be focused on Christ On Christ On Christ Which one do you want to belong to? Or which one do you want to be in the kingdom? A citizen or a slave? A slave comes to church with the mentality of I don't belong here a slave comes to church with the mentality of it's not my business. A slave comes to church with the mentality of after it's not my house, I can do things anyhow I want. A citizen is patriotic. He comes to church knowing that this is not just church, this is family. This is the kingdom of God and I must be involved for God's purpose to advance, I must commit myself. For God's purpose to advance, I need to grow. I need to grow. I need to develop myself. I need to give myself wholeheartedly to the process. I need to start doing something from where I am. Some of you start with one show. For instance, Thursday, we have midweek service. Sunday, Sunday service. Start from where you are. One show, minimum. Every day, talk to one show concerning this house. And then you're coming to church. Do everything you can. Bring one soul with you, a minimum. If you can't bring two, if you can't bring three, at least one. Some of you can begin to believe the Lord to pay transportation for other people. It's part of how you begin to grow. Take responsibility. Don't be a selfish Christian.
I saw the election where they were about to call result for a particular polling unit. And then the beavers went off. They couldn't uh, transmit results from the beavers. They said that there was no lights there and the beavers was not charged. It has gone off. Before the person who was saying it finished talking, one of the voters had gone to his house nearby. Jack, if you see the big generator, KVA generator, he Jack. This was like kind of like a pregnant woman was coming. He said, no excuse. Generator don't come. Oh yeah, charge them, charge them, charge them, transmit them for our eyes. What we we'll see? I said, see how these people are passionate for a kingdom that they are not guaranteed of anything. See how they are passionate. Somebody can jack generator. He doesn't care that the thing falls on him whether he dies there. See how people are busy cutting away with ballot. How do we busy cutting ballot boxes away? How do we busy the way a particular lady was beaten at the polling unit? Her eye was broken. She got back home, went to pharmacy, they put bandage on the eye. Blood was dripping out. She did not wait for the tea to heal. She ran back to her pulley unit with the same blood, went and killed to vote. Riots broke out. They broke the girl's eyes. When they came to steal pallet box, the girl still did not send. She ran back home, treated herself, ran back to pulley unit. How many Christians do we have like that? You know how to die for ni- Niger bet. You can passionately give your money just because you want to predict that Chelsea will win. And when Chelsea does not win, you are angry. You don't eat the whole night. For people who don't know you. For a club that will not share their profit with you. We can die for them. What about the God whose son died for you? This is what is missing in our Christendom today. Believers are becoming selfish. And the truth of the world are cooperating. Unbelievers are cooperating to expand their own territory. To bring in more souls into their own kingdom. To do exploits for themselves. Believers are disuniting. They are not cooperating. They are selfish. You are looking for them today. You are chasing them here tomorrow. They are not willing to sacrifice, give anything, give up their time, give up their... They are not willing to bring an additional person to the kingdom. They are not ready. They can set goals in other areas of their life except the kingdom. They won't set goals. They won't say, okay, Lord, this year, it will end though. I will give you 500 souls. And I will start every day by bringing two. Two is my... My co- my co- commitment to you, my covenant. I will start by bringing two, and I'll be keeping record two every Sunday, two every midweek service, two. I'll be bringing them, and I will visit them. I will pray for them. I will be there for them. I will encourage them until I see them grow, until I see them establish in this house, until I see them become sons profitable to God. If you see what God gives us people, if you see how God blesses us people. Lift up your hands wherever you are. Say with me, Father, I'm available. Now use me. Take me as I am. I am not, you know, but with you, you can do something. In your hands, I know I can be somebody. Without you, Lord, I am nothing. So I surrender my all. I give myself away. Totally. So you can use me. From where I am now, Lord, take me, break me, remold me, and use me. May my life never be the same again. From today, Lord, begin to do with me what you did with other great people. Start with me tonight. Start with me tonight in the name of Jesus. If you want to be in the hall of fame of those people who when they mention their name, you know these people are the ones who contributed to the advancement of the kingdom. You want to be in that kind of start from where you are now and start growing through the ladder. If people like Ragonki didn't give themselves for the service of the kingdom, look at last time they were showing the reports and the record of how many souls he won before he went to build the Lord, 100 million souls. One man.
Look at the Kumuis and all the other great men of God who are not even pastors. There are many I can mention who are not pastors. The great things they have done for God. Would you be left out? Thank you, Lord. We believe you've been transformed by the wonders of God's Word. For additional information about us, you can visit our website at www.princetonhills.org. You can also send us a mail at info at princetonhills.org or call 070-331-66762 or 081-31555-747. Princeton Hills Ministries, Raising Global Global Leaders. Leaders.